Matthew chapter 22 verse 34 through chapter 23 verse 12 verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Burkett notes, The Sadducees, being put by Christ to silence, the Pharisees again encounter him. They send to him a lawyer, that is, one of their interpreters and expounders of the law of Moses, who propounds this question to him, which is the greatest commandment of the law. Our Savior tells them, It is to love the Lord with all the heart, and with all the soul, and with all the mind. That is, with all the powers, faculties, and abilities of the soul, with the greatest measure and highest degrees of love. This is the sum and substance of the duties of the first table, and the second is like unto it, not equal with it, but like unto it. The duties of the second table are of the same authority and of the same necessity with the first. As a man cannot be saved without the love of God, so neither without the love of his neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. That is, the whole duty of man, required by Moses and the prophets, is comprehended in, and may be reduced to, these two heads, namely, the love of God and our neighbor. From the whole note one, that the fervency of all our affections, and particularly the supremacy of our love, is required by God as his right and due. Love must pass through and possess all the faculties of the soul. The mind must meditate upon God. The will must choose and embrace him. And the affections must take complacency and delight in him. The measure of loving God is to love him without measure. God reckons that we love him not at all, if we love him not above all. One, we must love him above all, appreciative, so as to prize him in our judgment and esteem above all and before all things. Two, we are to love God above all things comparative, preferring his favor above all things, comparatively hating whatever stands in competition with him. Three, we are to love God above all things intensive. That is, our longing and desire must run out after him if we pant and thirst for the enjoyment of him. We must love everything in subordination to God, and nothing coordinatedly or equally with God. Note, too, that thus to love God is the first and greatest commandment, great in regard of the object, which is God, the first cause and the chief good, great in regard to the obligation of it. To love God is so indispensable a command that God himself cannot free us from the obligation of it. For so long as he is God, and we as creatures we shall lie under a natural and necessary obligation to love and serve him. Great in regard of the duration of it, when faith shall be swallowed up in vision and hope in fruition, love will then be perfected in a full enjoyment. Note three, that every man may, yea, ought to love himself, not his sinful self, but his natural self, and especially his spiritual self, the new nature in him. This it ought to be, his particular care to increase and strengthen. Indeed, there is no express command in Scripture for a man to love himself, because the light of nature directs, and the law of nature binds and moves every man so to do. God has put a principle of self-love and self-preservation into all his creatures, but especially into man. Note 4. As every man ought to love himself, so it is every man's duty to love his neighbor as himself. One, not as he does love himself, but as he ought to love himself. Not in the same degree and measure that he loves himself, but after the same manner and with the same kind of love that he loves himself. As we love ourselves freely and readily, sincerely and unfeignedly, tenderly and compassionately, constantly and preservingly, so should we love our neighbor. Though we are not commanded to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves, yet we are to love him like we love ourselves. 
Note lastly that the duties of the first and second table are inseparable. The love of God and our neighbors must not be parted. He that loveth not his neighbor whom he hath seen never loved God whom he hath not seen. A conscientious regard to the duties of both table will be an argument to our sincerity and an ornament to our profession. Let it then be our prayer and daily endeavor that we may love the Lord our God with all our heart and our neighbors as ourselves. For this is the sum of the law and the substance of the gospel. Verses 41 through 45. While the Pharisee were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord has said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Burkett notes, The Pharisee had often put forth several questions maliciously unto Christ, and now Christ puts forth one question innocently unto them, namely, what they thought of the Messiah, whom they expected. They replied that he was to be the son of David, a secular prince descending from David, that should deliver them from the power of the Romans and restore them to their civil rights. This was the notion they had of the Messiah, that he should be a man, the son of David, and nothing more. Our Savior replies, Whence is it then that David calls the Messiah Lord? Psalm 60, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, How could he be both David's Lord and David's son? No son is the Lord to his father. Therefore, if Christ were David's sovereign, he must be more than a man, more than David's son. As a man, so he was David's son, as God-man, so that he was David's Lord. Note hence that although Christ was really and truly man, yet he was more than a bare man. He was a Lord unto and was a salvation of his own forefathers. Note three, that the only way to reconcile the scriptures which speak concerning Christ is to believe and acknowledge him to be God and man in one person. The Messiah as a man was to come forth out of David's loin. But as a God-man, he was David's sovereign and savior. As man, he was his father's son. As God, he was the Lord to his own father. Chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. Burkett notes, The scribes and Pharisees, so often mentioned in the gospel, were the great doctors and spiritual guide among the Jews. Scribe is the name of an office. Pharisee, the name of a sect. They were both learned in the law and teachers of the law of Moses. Our blessed Savior, in the former part of this gospel, held many conferences with these men and used the most persuasive arguments to convince them both of their errors and wickedness. But their obstinacy and malice being such that neither our Savior's ministry nor miracles could convince them. Hereupon, our Lord denounces in this chapter eight several woes against them. But first, he charitably warns his disciples and the multitude against the pernicious practices of this sort of men, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That is, they teach and expound the law of Moses, which they were wont to do sitting. Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. That is, what they teach you consonant to the word of God and agreeable to the writings of Moses and the prophets, if they go not out of Moses' chair into their own unwritten traditions, follow their doctrine and obey their precepts. But do not after their works. Follow not their example. Take heed of their pride and hypocrisy, of their ambition and vainglory. Obey their doctrine wherein it is sound, but follow not their example wherein it is corrupt. Learn one that the personal miscarriages of ministers must by no means beget a disesteem of their office and ministry. Charity must teach us to distinguish betwixt the calling and the crime. Two, 
that the infallible truths of God recommended to us by a vicious teacher ought to be entertained and obeyed by us without either scruple or prejudice. What the Pharisees themselves, says Christ, bid you observe, that observe and do. 3. That no people are obliged to follow their teacher's pattern and example any further than it is agreeable to the scripture rule and conformable to Christ's example. Do not after their works, who say and do not. Verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Burkett notes, These heavy burdens, which the Pharisee lay upon the people's shoulders, were counsels and directions, rules and canons, austerities and severities, which the Pharisees introduced and imposed upon their hearers, but would not undergo the least part of those severity themselves. If we do not follow our own counsels, we must not think to oblige our people to follow them. No man ought to press upon others what he is unwilling to perform himself. It is very sinful to give that counsel to others which we refuse to take ourselves. Verses 5-7 through seven. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue and greeting in the market to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Burkett notes, In these words, our blessed Savior admonishes his disciples and the multitude to take heed of imitating the Pharisee in their ostentation and hypocrisy, and their ambition and vainglory. And he instances in three particulars wherein they express it. One, all their works, says Christ, they do to be seen of men. To do good works that men may see them is a duty but to do any or all of our works to be seen of men is hypocrisy. Two, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. These phylacteries were certain scrolls and labels of parchment in which were written the Ten Commandments and some sections of the law, and they tied these to their foreheads and pinned them upon their left sleeve, that the law of God might be continually before their eyes and perpetually in their remembrance. This ceremony they judged God prescribed them, Deuteronomy 6, 8. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as a frontlet between thine eyes. By enlarging the borders of their garments, our Savior points at the fringes and blue ribbons which the Jews did wear upon their garments in obedience to the command, Numbers 15, 37, 38. As the threads in those fringes and ribbons close woven together did represent the connection, complication, and inseparable conjunction of God's commandments among themselves, so the wearing of these fringes was to put them in mind of the law of God, that which way soever they turned their eyes, they might meet with some pious admonition to keep the law of God. Now the vainglorious Pharisees, that they might be thought more mindful of the law of God than other men, did make their phylacteries broader and their fringes thicker and longer than other men. 3. They fondly affected and ambitiously contended for the first and uppermost seats in all conventions, as at feasts and in the synagogues, and loved to be respectfully saluted in open and public places, and to have the titles of honor, such as rabbi, master, father and doctor, put upon them. Now that which our Savior condemns is the Pharisees' fond affectation of these little things, and unduly seeking their own honor and glory. It was not their talking, but their loving the uppermost rooms at feasts that Christ condemns. From the whole, note, one, that hypocrites are fond of affecting ceremonial observations and outward parts of commanded duties, neglecting the substance of religion itself. These Pharisees were for carrying a library of God's laws on their clothes, scarce a letter of it in their hearts. They wore the law of God as frontlets before their eyes, but not engraven on the tables of their hearts. Observe, too, that the nature of hypocrisy is to study more to seem religious in the sight of men than to be religious indeed before God. The hypocrite is the world's saint and not God's. He courts the world's acceptation more than the divine favor and approbation. Verses 8-12 through 12. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all are your brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among ye shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself shall be abased, 
and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Burkett notes, The word rabbi signifies a doctor or teacher eminently endowed with a variety of knowledge, whose place it was to sit in the exalted chair or chief seat in the synagogue. Their disciples and scholars sat upon lower forms at the feet of their teachers. Our Savior did not simply condemn the giving or receiving of these titles of rabbi, master, and father, but the things forbidden are, one, a vainglorious affectation of such titles as these, the ambitious seeking of them and glorying in them. Two, he condemns the authority and domination over the consciences of men which the pharisaical doctors had usurped, telling the people that they ought to believe all their doctrines and practice all their injunctions as the commands of the living God. They did, in effect, assume infallibility to themselves. Learn hence, one, that there have been, in all ages of the church, a sort of teachers who have usurped authority and domination over the faith and consciences of men. Two, that Christians ought not to submit their faith and consciences in matters of religion to any human authority whatsoever, nor to give up themselves absolutely to the conduct of any man's judgment or opinion in matters of the faith. Three, that Christ alone, the great prophet and infallible teacher of his church, is the only person to whose doctrine and precepts we owe absolute faith and obedience. One is your master, even Christ. Four, as God will abase and men will despise the proud, especially ministers who are such, so shall God exalt and men will honor them that stoop to the meanest services for the good of souls. Whoso exalteth himself shall be abased. This was a sentence often used by our Savior and was a frequent saying among the Jews.